Lisa, let's go. Good evening, early evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the webinar uh, sponsored by Eagle Dupont Business School. And the topic is From Emergence to Convergence, Technology for Competitiveness and Circular Economy. And thank you very much for all of you are connecting from different parts of the world um, to get started. I have some small instructions to guide you through and how to how to spend the one hour together. So whenever you have a question or you have some ideas you want to share, please do not hesitate to send them in the chat from the beginning to the end. We have dedicated team members to keep an eye on the flow of the conversation and the information going. And this, the, the webinar is made of uh, majorly two parts. The first part will be a discussion panel where you can see that um, Dr. Giogas and Dr. Marcus Basito and someone uh, and Dr. Summon is right there. So it will be a panel discussion for half an hour and throwing throwing questions and back and forth. So it's quite interactive. It's not the traditional of the lecturing type, not at all. And the second session will will be the uh, will be the discussion and the Q and A session. So would be the questions coming out from you. So the earlier that you send your question, you get out, you get better chance actually to be spotted out. And um, hopefully, I can talk to you very soon. All right. Um, just a little bit introduction of the background, and I will be the moderator of this webinar. My name is Lisa Schoen, and I graduated my graduate from Ecole de Pont Business School. So I feel very honored to be here and to participate in this event. Um, and we also have uh, Dr. Giorgos, and um, he is also a graduate actually from our program. And currently he's working with the European Union. Um, we have uh, Dr. Mar Marcus Besito. He is the, uh, he has multiple hats. Uh, among all of that, uh, the most important of course, is the uh, graduates from Ecole de Pont Business School as well with the doctor degree and not as a, not the first one, he already have a couple. So, and then is Dr. Saman. And um, he is also gaining the degree of Ecole de Pont Business School. And three of, three of them coming from different domains with different expertise and with conversation unfolding. And we would understand their expertise a bit more. Right. So um, I would like to pass the ground to actually Mark first. So could you share us what you up to um, and uh, what's your position in this webinar and what would you like to share in this webinar with us? So uh, Lisa, first of all, thank you. And uh, nice to see George and Saman and yourself within the same call. Um, so in uh, this webinar, um, I'll take here primarily of the conversation on uh, the microeconomics competitiveness uh, research branch, which is something that um, I've been working for uh, almost 10 years now, but that I was um, happy to see integrated also in the call de Pont, both when I was doing my, my doctoral studies, but also later on. Um, and that also led to at least, you know, three of us in this call, yourself, Lisa, Samani, myself, being part of the uh, MOC network at Harvard Business School. Um, that would be pretty much my my emphasis for today. But considering that uh, George also um, and I have been working extensively together, we're celebrating soon uh, 10 years of our friendship, circular economy and, and competitiveness, they equally have strong ties. And I will be happy to explore this in the conversation with George, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the underlying will be technology that someone will so nicely represent. Back to you, Lisa. Right. 
Thank you very much. And uh, it's very clear. So uh, we um, we have multiple linkage among different uh, the different speakers uh, of the experts. All right, here comes to you, George. And uh, can you share something with us? And then what, what is the central message that you would like to send out today? Sure, uh, many thanks, Lisa. Again, I'm, I'm gonna echo what Mark said about being so happy with uh, the panel that we are today with, uh, with you, with Saman and Mark as well. Um, well, for, for, for me, uh, I'm going to represent more the circular economy bit of the story, uh, which is a topic that, um, yeah, it's it's uh, rather trending recently, but this is a topic that we have already touched with uh, uh, Mark working, and I think I think it's the sixth year now um, that we have already been exploring the topic, so this is not new to us. And um, uh, also a little bit the journey uh, of the ecosystem that um, you just mentioned, and also Mark mentioned between the familiarity and the relationship that exists between all of us um, and uh, how this has uh, evolved through the years to become what it is today. And we're gonna be happy to share it with uh, the, the audience um, and, and give them our experience and, and our take, not just to the, um, the key topics that we're covering, but also on how this came into the forefront to become uh, topics within mega trends and how we are engaged with that. Um, so, um, so happy to be here with this, um, this gang, allow me to say, uh, and uh, floor back to you, Lisa. All right, thank you. And one, one thing that we didn't mention is that actually at the Palm Business School, we have established two established um, research center. And Mark, is this the, um, we call it CPC Paris? Yes, that's the Center for Policy and Competitiveness. Um, it, it came to life pretty much similar time than when the Center uh, for Circular Economy that George is leading uh, was basically pushed forward. Because uh, I think we found that being in Paris, we had both a responsibility with, of course, the business community. But, you know, Paris is also a policymaker hub. So we thought that it would be nice that a school like Ecole called Pont and his historical legacy equally had a representation with the policy side. And that also uh, gave us a lot of uh, reasons to start working more and more with the multilateral institution like the EU and, and more. Um, so I, I think the blend between public and private interest in this sense were represented by um, the genesis of the CPC. Well, thank you, Mark. And later on, when we get into deeper the conversation, we would, of course, like the name from emergence to convergence to to reveal just a little bit background story and how everything happened. Because when we read from the website, everything is very formal. But I think our audience are much more interested, really, how how these initiatives they are being shaped. All right, I'm going to go back to Gorgos. And what is the name of the of the center? Of, in the circular economy that actually it called the Palm Business School is having at the moment? So the center is um, a called Center for Circular Economy Research. So it's Circular Economy Research Center, basically CERC. Um, and uh, as, um, it's, as Mark said that we, we you know, capture the essence of what is gonna be needed, the new shift, the new paradigms, um, which we were kind of, you know, I would even say pioneers in taking that, uh, um, these two signals and we realized that, especially for circular economy, that is not just an exact science, it's a fusion of, of sciences, it's a fusion of domains, that new uh, research, new leadership would be needed. So that is why we, we went into the forefront. And of course, I'm, 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 I'm gonna be very happy in a while to share also the backgrounds of it because I, I totally agree with what you say. If you read the website, it, it, you know, it gives all this formal information but I think that what is important is, is what is not on that website. So, um, and, and we'll be very happy to share it in a while. But the, the, the point is that we all, all wanted to assume part of our responsibility being part of such a, a leading institution and doing research and being part of doctorate programs that they're supposed to make a change. And this is what we, would be, we were determined to do ourselves to put our own contribution into that. So that is why, um, in parallel to Mark's effort, we launched also the uh, Research Center on Circular Economy. And the fusion that we also achieved, which we will describe in a while, it's, it's pretty unique for what it stands right now. Well, thank you. And personally, I owe both of you a thank you because 
Uh, one of my paper uh, finished for the doctor, actually, it's surrounded on the circular economy. I, I was uh, writing the paper on sustainable luxury, which the circular economy, it's a very important component on, on that front. And together with the uh, the European Union sustainable goals, like 17 goals, I, I quoted on that as well. So thank you very much. And now let's move on to someone who's been waiting in silence and smiling for a long time, right? Now is your turn. And can you please share with me, I know that you are moving, you're coming from the technology background and and although you're you're getting involved more academics, but still you're not letting your old background go. It just turned them into an academic way and scholarly way of looking at things. Can you share with us what do you see and what's your position on today's webinar? Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yes, in fact, I'm coming from uh, technology, IT, telecommunication uh, background. Uh, more on security network and uh, everything as a service platform design architecture. But uh, thanks to a call the phone business school and the very rich uh, network that we have here, I had the pleasure to continue the work that I started with Mark 10 years ago here in a call the phone business school as he's uh, leading the center for policy and competitiveness. Uh, I found actually with the help of our Dean, uh, Professor Alain Rosen, uh, he really helped me navigate my doctoral research under a Center for Policy and Competitiveness and uh, Circular Economy Research Center, uh, bringing technology as the, uh, as the glue, basically, to link my work to these two. And uh, this has also led to a deeper involvement of my professional uh, work, uh, aside from the school with the companies and with the industry as an advisor for technology. And basically today also, I'm going to talk about the important role that technology plays in enabling circular economy and also empowering uh, microeconomics of competitiveness. So that would be my part. So I'm, I'm very glad to be here today. I'm very glad to have uh, Mark Yorgos and yourself here on this panel. And uh, basically this event today is the first uh, episode of a series that I'm launching uh, in order to uh, focus on uh, the important role that technology plays in, in digital economy, basically, that, they are, that we are uh, moving toward and the importance of having the proper leadership, uh, all of us as individuals, as, uh, as institutions, as uh, decision makers, and as business schools, and, uh, uh, you know, as basically everyone who is involved in understanding uh, technology and understanding what can be done and what needs to be done and how uh, macroeconomics of competitiveness is directly linked to circular economy and United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are the hot topics of today uh, and uh, upcoming years. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, Saman. And I think, uh, you know, as we already seen that technology at the very beginning is a separated as an extra or catalyst and moving after two decades or three decades now become the infrastructure and must have on top of other business. So uh, definitely I see that your research topic is very trendy and is very relevant nowadays. So, and I can see that your LinkedIn post, you already had a couple of cybersecurity and this webinar happened. I'm pretty sure your research will make great contribution for other managers and to learn and how to cope with in the, in the this, this, uh, digital world. All right, so because I have to be the time uh, <laughs> gotter, so, and then I go to the question one by one then to unfold uh, this conversation. So we we'll start with the mark. Can you introduce about this competitiveness concept and where is it coming from? I know there's a relationship with the Harvard Business School because I personally got trained thanks to you and to a Gotopon Business School who invested in me. And could you share with us the, you know, the concept and uh, in general sense? Yes, thanks, Lisa. So, um, you know, roughly speaking, at the beginning of the millennial, uh, Michael Porter from Harvard Business School started to blend the idea that economics and strategy could actually generate a domain of study. And he tried to apply this uh, to economic development. So he started to study how regions somehow are competing uh, through uh, the dynamic nature of their business environment, uh, leading to the formation of clusters. And this cluster bring in a quite unique value proposition, both in terms of goods and services in the market. So that's in a nutshell where he originated. 
Over time, it became one of the ways for governments to start measuring their economic performance beyond just GDP. Uh, then the World Economic Forum started to uh, produce the competitiveness index. And today around the world, the world competitiveness has become part of the government's agenda around, you know, around the globe. So the governments do not only want to perform in terms of economic growth, but they equally want to create long-term productivity by enhancing also standards of living. That's in a nutshell. The work of competitiveness today is a bit more under, I would say, a transformation, considering that the sense of proximity that is, is characterizing clusters is so like compromised by the fact that many digital uh, services are being produced. So today we're finding, I would say, the upgrading or a redefining of the role. It's a fascinating period of uh, history for us to look at how competitiveness continue to evolve, but it's really the study of economic growth, not in terms of just narrowly defined financial performance, but equal in terms of quality of life and, and the degree of productivity that uh, countries or region produce. So this is an important bulk, I think, of the work we do at, at the Cold Upon. The center wants to honor the spirit of the original idea. And that's why we are in a, one of the few uh, affiliate in France of the HBS network. Back to you, Lisa. I think I just muted myself. Thank you very much for that. I actually would have a follow up to question, but I, I want to let the floor just rolling a bit. And then in terms of the concept, and can you, Georgas, can you introduce what is the circle economy? I'm pretty sure it's different from MOC in the sense, right? Well, I mean, although it's different, and I would agree with you on that, it's highly complementary and it's an internal component of it because practically circular economy, it's a paradigm shift. It's, it's in a way um, a new restorative and regenerative business model. That's what it is. We are changing things from what we used to be with the linear economy, with the take, make, dispose into uh, um, that were progressing to recycling. And then now it's in circular because the recycling was looking at the end point of the business model. And now circular economy is going back to look from the very beginning of the making of the services, the making of the products, and to look at the, the entire cycle in order to respect the scarcity of resources, as well as the environmental impact that we uh, managed to achieve in this planet. So the point is that, and where, where um, competitiveness is coming into the forefront uh, in, related to that is that, be it a business model circular economy, it still needs to be a viable. It needs to be a competitive business model. So it, it, needs, to, it needs to enable the, 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 the businesses that are transitioning to circular economy to remain competitiveness in this new uh, landscape that is being created. Um, and, and similarly to technology, which I will link in a while uh, after someone presents it, but circular economy, in this shifting of the whole production and consumption life, life cycle with the mindset that we need to adapt is very, very strongly linked to the two topics that we're discussing today. And I'm very happy that the two colleagues are taking concrete actions on both of them. So this is a little bit the, the, um, the piece of the puzzle that is gluing the, the things together as well. Oh, thank you. And um, I'm just curious a little about into the more practical sense, right, as from the research side. And is there any reason to justify why the CPC, the center of the competitiveness, and start first? I know it's, we establish a center first and then circle economy center second. Is it because of the scope of the study and there are certain complementary? Mark, can you make a little bit of comments on that? Yeah, so Lisa, you know, historically, you know, I, I personally was part of, uh, of Michael Porter in my postdoc at HBS in 2010. So that's when I was exposed for the first time to the concept. At the time, I had a permanent position in France at Grenoble. And so I introduced what was called the Lab Center for Competitiveness. Um, the circular economy is, is something that uh, actually Yorgos and I explored for the first time in 2015. Uh, when, uh, you know, from his side at the U EU level and from my side at the time I was teaching uh, at Harvard, uh, we started to think, can we build a public consultation that will then eventually lead? So I have to say, we have a chronological dimension here to take into account. 
to be honest, the moment that this was becoming, I think, um, a public consultation from the EU, it didn't take long then for us then to see Yorgos uh, moving forward and and uh, and thinking of setting the Circular Economy Center at Ponce, which was a natural differentiation between competitiveness and circular economy. But then in real life, right, we are much more convergent, right? And that's the, the beauty of this. And, and I think uh, Saman later on will tell us more about the forthcoming center that is uh, pioneering, even that one is another form of convergence. So I think we always think in terms of convergence. That's also why I think the title of this webinar about convergence and emergent is not just a nice title, but I think it reflects nicely the way we think and the way we are at Pont, but also in our, in our professional domains. Well, Mark, I, I am very happy that you're willing to share, and that's the purpose of this, uh, this webinar, to share what are the actions and activities behind those website and research center, how we establish, what triggered or, or what inspired us to have this research center. And it passed down to you, Gurgis. And um, when was research center, the Circle Economy Center started, established, and what inspired you to have this idea and to initiate the center to, to, to come to the world? Well, I mean, if I need to go first on this one, I would say that um, in, in a very simple world, this, everything, this, you know, I don't think that it was started in 2015, as Mark said, I think it started in 2010. Um, I, I think that, um, 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 Mark has been, at least for my, my side, the, the, the turning point on many things in my life. Um, from the, 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 the way um, uh, we met uh, in, in his class in Harvard in 2010, uh, and the way we connected and we started, you know, um, uh, spinning things around and, and making and breaking and, and doing, you know, trying because you know it's a little bit romantic to say that everything we have done it has been a huge success, but I think that the huge success is that we persevered from from the um, uh, successes and failures and failures and successes, and we built it up. So the the entire thing of the discussion, and that's why when I was involved with circular economy, I, I I went back to Mark, and I explained to him that you know this is the session. This is this is the things that we have been taught and dis be discussing at, um, at class because back then Mark, uh, Mark was uh, teaching systems uh, thinking and there's a lot of systems thinking and systems architecture and engineering into the circular economy. So immediately it was like, okay, for me, it was a no brainer that this is something that needs to be re-engineered. It needs to be so differently. We need to see a little bit the loops and all these kind of things. So everything has started back then and of course, we need to uh, um, underline here the value of, of, the, of the school, which gave us the, the, the grounds to, you know, to plant the seeds and grow them up and, and do successful ventures, which is all about of what the school should be doing. Um, but the whole concept and, 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 and the way it all started, it was way before where we were enabled to do so. And I guess, the, uh, I mean, for me, uh, this has been a, a very simple answer. It, it, it started from Mark and, and, and for that, I would be, you know, grateful forever because that's, you know, that was the turning point on start building things together and always um, having someone that you can turn to and provide you with this guidance that you need and, and, and you know, and make you greater than you are. So, the, and that's why I agree with Mark, the, 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 the title today of convergence, it's very, very, very important and very current into what we're doing. And last word, the convergence is even more important for the topic I'm dealing related to uh, circular economy. So this is where everything starts and we hope that this is the way it will grow because this is just the beginning, hopefully. So this is a little bit my first, um, take on that and, 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 and don't worry, I have more insights to share in a while. All right, I feel like I have to stop you. It's like the story is never ending. Well, personally, I have to be very thankful 
for Ecole de Pont Business School for my uh, for me to choose the topic of circular economy and competitiveness as well, because currently I'm taking a professor position, associate professor position in, in the French EM Lyon Business School. And one of the key subjects that I'm following on is on competitiveness. So I am I am passing on the intellectual baton actually from original Harvard and to, Ian, to the Ecole de Pont Business School and to Ian Leon to have a certain continuity in terms of knowledge diffusion and also to have a certain revive because the competitive nowadays as Saman next step will talk about is the, the role of technology is playing a very bigger role and let alone about the COVID and in uh, the COVID that is playing in the competitiveness. So I'm going to go back to you, Saman, right? So um, so can you tell us some examples that actually enabled the technology in the context of the circular economy and competitiveness? Sure. So uh, basically, so as, as you already put it, uh, the word, real, the key word there is uh, uh, enabling. So technology is really an enabler for circular economy and competitiveness from different perspectives. So if you look at the infrastructures, uh, if you look at the energy transport systems, telecommunication, production and value chain, everything that you see that we need to rework and re-engineer our systems and our ecosystem in order to achieve higher competitiveness and in order to get closer, hopefully, to circular economy uh, deployment globally, uh, technology has a major role to play. So. Uh, these roles are, uh, there are several key roles that technology plays. For example, circular economy is about collaboration. It cannot work out without collaboration. And for collaboration, we need communication. We need connectivity. We need compatibility. And we need coherence. So this is where technologies such as telecom, routing, switching network, security, cybersecurity, XG for 4G and 5G and the rest come into play. Uh, then we need insight. We need to turn data into information and the information into insight. And this is where uh, we need this insight to take decisions. Uh, we need this insight to understand what can be uh, like the future of our value chains, what can come up uh, out of the, our economic systems. And this is how we got to the problem that we're uh, trying to solve today from take, make, dispose to go to circular economy. So here, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, Big data and data analytics are some good examples of technologies that are enabling us uh, to do so. Then uh, we need the feedback loops and we need to connect our physical, digital and biological realms together. And this is uh, the role of IoT, Internet of Things or connected devices, intelligent assets and uh, smart, basically smart uh, assets that we have. So these are the technologies. And finally, uh, it's about trust. So trust. Uh, in terms of traceability of our uh, assets and information, uh, about transparency, uh, about having tamper-proof records, about having timestamp records of what has happened in different stages of a value chain, if you take that example. And this is the role of distributed ledger technologies, DLTs, or blockchain as a, as a very famous example of the DLTs. And uh, asset tokenization, crypto economics, and crypto assets are the major technologies that come into play. Uh, to enable basically the move towards circular economy and to reinforce microeconomics of competitiveness. All right, I know that's because uh, personally I, I received a degree as well that in the uh, Ecole de Pont Business School pioneered and to issue the degree actually in the blockchain uh, format. Is that, what is that, Saman? Yeah, basically, so yeah, um, so we basically have a, a proof of graduation, which is hosted on the blockchain system that we have integrated. Uh, so basically, it's very easy for uh, our graduates and also for our participants to share their uh, documents or their proof of graduation uh, as a link. So the link is hosted on the website of the school. And basically, uh, for background checks, for employers, for you know, um, visa, immigration, and all the things that you would need, uh, you know, some sort of document verification, they can see that what you provide to them is actually uh, is genuine because they can see that the exact information also exists on the, on the website of the school. So that is a very uh, simple example of how we use blockchain technology to bring trust and how technology can, can basically 
uh, help us uh, get done, get things done faster and more reliably. Right. This is a very fun example because personally, I found it benefits my life a lot because because in the past you have to guard your a piece of paper for your life. You know, even if your your home is being flooded, you know, what, rather than grabbing the wallet and and the credit card, what do you do? You have to grab your degree first because there is no repetitive issue of that. So it's a very funny in, a scenario that I can think of, and. Um, I, I just want to keep a bit reminder from our audience because I don't know how many people are get connected right now. And if you have any question, if you want to make any comments, please do not hesitate to share in the in the chat. And therefore, I can pick it up because by five, if I'm not mistaken, by 530 or one minute or another five minutes, and then I have to spin on the question from the audience. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go on a little bit more on the competitiveness center, right? Um, what, why do we put policy as the, you know, one of the key, key name, key words in the, in the title? So, uh, Lisa, you know, for, for quite some time, and this is particularly true in France, right? Do you used to have people that wanted to go work in, in, in the private sector and they, had, they were going to Grande Ecole and people that wanted to go work in, in the public sector and they were going to the, the political science uh, schools, right? Sciences Po, for example, right, uh, is an example of that. I think for too long, we have been keeping uh, a bit of divergence uh, between public and private. And, you know, you were never expecting a business school to talk about policy like you never expect in a political science school to talk about business. I think we understood that the world has much more um, of a blur boundaries. There's no longer as many silos as there used to be before. Um, and, and therefore we thought that policy is an important piece of it. Cause I guess where I personally see um, the role of policy becoming more predominant today is that for too long we have been ignoring the role governments have. But government have huge powers that they need to be integrated inside of a constructive uh, form of a value creation. And, you know, for too long, we only think that only private sector generates value, but equally government generate value, just to generate in a different way. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to put the policy p uh, bit in it. Uh, one, because I think we want it to be an open institution where we're thinking about a policy within the, the premise of a business school. But also, I think because by my own setup, the setup of other people like George, you know, we work with policymakers. We have a direct contact with them, and we need to educate them in the same way as we would educate somebody to run a business. So I think this is why policy became, uh, you know, uh, centric to the interests of the center. Um, and I, I believe it's uh, really something that more business schools should be doing. The only experiment I have seen that was really successful is, of, again, back to when Michael Porter was teaching the MOC at the Kennedy School, where basically, you know, government students were taking a competitiveness course. Um, and that was an interesting experiment to say, what if we're bringing two different population in the same classroom? What kind of conversation will we have? And I believe uh, also in our own students, especially the contingent coming from Morocco, many of them, they have government roles. Uh, the director of the Code Pony in, in North Africa used to be uh, a member of the parliament. So, so I think in our personal journey, policy was never exchanged or alienated. It was part of our history. Um, Mark, what you said is absolutely very true. And also this is aligned with the Michael Porter uh, original design of the uh, Harvard course, because I remember the first very patch of the students actually they are government officials and the course the MOC course was established as an executive training and bit by bit the knowledge starts spreading out from it's it's kind of kind of the top down approach and now they're even they're even branding we're even talking about to create the impact so originate from the designing of a country's competitiveness and to the impact infiltrating to different level and gets to even now a master degree as an example. Absolutely, so I think it's that's spot on. Absolutely, that's, uh, I'm happy you're bringing this up, right? Because I think it's, uh, it's uh, I think we were pioneering this and more schools will eventually integrate very similar thinking as we move forward. 
Uh, and the fact that you are in, in one of France's top business school, right? But you're now uh, bringing forward a competitiveness conversation, which is more uh, policy friendly. It shows you that even business schools are exploring this. All right. All right. Thank you. And I, I would like just to move on to the circle economy on this concept. And um, so in, in the previous conversation, Georges, you mentioned about a key concept. It's called system thinking. Right. And you related the relationship between system thinking and circular economy. What what is the scale of the circular economy? And probably is related with the concept. Can you who should care about circular economy? Is it is it an easy project like business model for inside a company just to switch? Uh, you. <laughs> You, you share some very crucial questions. The, the answer, uh, at least one of them is very simple. All of us should care. I mean, not just businesses, actually it should come from the personal initiative and then it should be infused into businesses. Um, because the whole point of the circular economy is that we need to reverse the damage that we have done to the planet while respecting the, the scarcity of resources and at the same time understanding that hopefully civilization will need to exist for many years from now. So if we don't have resources, that's a big issue. And the way we are producing and consuming right now, it's not sustainable, full stop. It will not, it will not last forever. So the answer to that, I mean, who should be caring about circular economy is everyone. Um, and, and it has to become actually a cultural change rather than a business change. And if it becomes a cultural change, it will become a business practice. But we know that you know, the world operates a little bit different. So that is why the key policies um, that we see also, and when we started doing that also with Mark a few years ago, we talked to commissioners, we talked to a lot of high uh, profile people to understand what is, what is the issue related to that. The point is that it takes time. It's not gonna change today from today, tomorrow. It, it was gonna take, take some time. I would tend to say decades the whole point is that what we need to see is how to achieve that, okay? And definitely the, the, the business sector is a prime uh, um, actor in this discussion and the business sector has one preoccupation. How am I gonna be viable tomorrow? How am I gonna survive my employees? Um, so it's not just the profit. So the, the discussions that are being now around is how to transform into these uh, new models while uh, not killing the business in the middle of the transition. And that's why I think the two components of this discussion, the competitiveness aspects, as well as the technological aspects are crucial because from a competitiveness point of view, of view um, micro or micro, macro, uh, we need to be looking at the viability of the um, ecosystem for the long run, but also at the same time, we need to bear, bear in mind who are these key accelerators for the transition? And definitely technology is one of the biggest accelerators that will come into the forefront and will help us expedite a lot. It's not just um, because I agree with all what Saman said and you know the, the, um, the crucial contribution of the uh, new technologies, distributing ledgers, et cetera, et cetera, but they are not just the security bit. It's also the acceleration factor they give. Um, I'm sure that, that Mark has a lot of experience with artificial intelligence and they can tell you a lot of examples that expedite things that in the past it took us ages to, to do. So the whole point here that we need to be careful, especially with the circular economy, is to be able, um, like in every model, to harvest the quick wins and replicate them and then start building into more long-term uh, systemic changes that we need to pursue because that, 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 that is the whole point of this discussion and that's why I'm, I'm very happy that we are having these two centers plus the one that's going to be announced by Seman because the point is that we are leveraging on complementary expertise between each other in order to be able you know to, to uh, uh, make this convergence of added value for the sectors that we're, we are involved. So that's very crucial point for the domain of circular economy. And this integrating factor, the complementarity is so needed and so um, important. And the last thing I wanna make, make um, a point is 
on the education. The, the, the type of education and the type of skills, the skill acquisition has changed. And I think that Mark has been around much more uh, time than I've been. In, in, and the, the people are educated in, in all sorts of different ways um, and in, in, in different modes. Of course, they need examples. They need professors, of course, all these kind of things. But the, 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 the knowledge acquisition has changed dramatically. And we need to adhere at, at, at this change as well as ourselves, if we want to achieve the highest level of penetration that will lead to the transition that we need. So um, that, 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 that's my two cents on, the, on this one. Georgos said, you know, from just now, like five minutes of talking, the keywords that I get is it's a big change management. So this change management is not happening only for inside one company or one country one government is actually trying to mobilize all human behavior change. So that we're including the government way of managing, including the end consumer behavior change, actually coming out from our um, Q&A, because I'm looking, taking a look on the uh, questions. We already have a couple of questions coming up. And um, so one of the question is, what I understand that consumer behavior also play an important role towards sustainable circular economy. Could you please share one example on the on the change consumer behavior? I don't know anyone anyone out of you like among the three who wants to take an example. Someone. Yeah, I can go. I'm actually linking the questions here that uh, we have from the audience. So uh, if you don't mind, I go one by one because they they can sort of build up uh, okay. on top of each other. Uh, so, yeah, the relationship between cryptocurrency and a circular economy. So uh, this also links to the other question. So cryptocurrencies by themselves, they're just one of the applications of uh, blockchain uh, and distributed ledger technologies. So how they can be useful is that um, blockchain helps us with sociocultural and behavioral behavior engineering of, of basically the end users and also of companies and industries, how? Uh, one uh, good example um, of cryptocurrencies, if you like, is um, the company uh, uh, which is called the Provenance, which is a blockchain startup, uh, tested technology uh, with the fishing industry. Uh, they, use, uh, they use cryptocurrencies to track tuna, this is for value chain. The other one is the plastic bank, which basically pays people to help, uh, to help basically gathering the plastic uh, uh, waste and you know, behavioral engineering of the society, for example. So these are some examples. IBM Food Trust uh, is a very good example also in terms of value chain and also bringing the trust uh, to the market. So this is how cryptocurrency could work. Yes, there are many other sort of uh, downsides to cryptocurrency, some of them obviously because of the uh, uh, proof of concept, proof of, uh, the proof of concept that they use, like proof of work for Bitcoin, for example, which are not environmental friendly, but well, that, that leads us to a very deep conversation about cryptocurrencies that unfortunately we don't have the time. But in general, talking about blockchain technology itself as an enabler, it helps us really with the building that trust, bringing that transparency, and also incentivizing people to do, uh, to do better, basically, to support the, uh, the move towards circular economy. Um, then uh, it links to um, the other question, how do you suggest circular economy could be applied in 5G deployment in underdeveloped countries? So there are several folds to this question. Uh, one is how circular economy uh, can be applied in 5G. So as you know, the 5, 5G technology is the, is the next, I mean, the upcoming technology with 10 to 100 times uh, faster speed than 4G. So, um, the benefit uh, is basically uh, lower latency, um, uh, tighter security, lower energy consumption, and better reliability. And this is exactly where we are talking about uh, hyper-connected uh, economy that we have today and uh, how 5G plays a pivotal uh, role uh, for safety, efficiency, and reliability in a world that we are going to have cobotics, basically people and robotics uh, collaborating together in smart manufacturing, and uh, you know, uh, you know, automated uh, vehicles and everything else. So this is the role of 5G for circular economy. And basically, we will have about more than 
4 billion connected devices by 2024, uh, which means that we need increased security, we need increased speed, because if we're talking about collaboration and connectivity, and uh, we need the lowest latency possible because machines are going to communicate with each other on a real-time basis. Imagine like uh, driverless uh, tr trucks uh, on, the, on the street, uh, collaborating with drones and everything else. It's a super complex uh, ecosystem and we need to manage. And that is this, uh, the very important role of 5G uh, that, uh, that will bring. Because uh, transport only itself accounts for 25% of the global emissions and uh, more than 70% of it comes from short journeys. So that is where basically now uh, smart mobility comes into play and smart mobility cannot be deployed without 5G. So uh, that also answers to that question. So the other question is about uh, the closed loop supply chain, uh, reuse of the primary source of uh, manufacturing material. For that, I have one example and obviously Yorgos might have uh, better ones. So for that, my answer is um, uh, industrial symbiosis. Uh, basically industrial symbiosis is uh, uh, when uh, the waste or the byproducts of uh, one part becomes the raw material for the other parts of uh, uh, industrial parks and uh, industrial symbiotic uh, systems. And uh, that is very important for competitiveness as well because um, it increases uh, profitability uh, by reducing the cost of, uh, the, uh, sorry, the cost of resources. It uh, reduces the demand for extraction of materials. It, um, it reduces uh, waste disposal costs uh, we have better use of otherwise unused industrial flows. Um, we have uh, new business opportunities and revenue from residues. Uh, we have um, uh, added value, knowledge creation, spillover of innovation and impact. And uh, the most famous example is uh, Kallenberg in Denmark since 1972, for example. So these are my two cents on this. Uh, and yes, uh, lots of cryptocurrencies can hurt the climate if uh, we continue to use Bitcoin. So I hope that uh, proof of stake and uh, Ethereum's next uh, update can help this. And also there are a lot of green cryptocurrencies uh, that are under development. So the future is bright. All we need is uh, uh, thought leaders, uh, engineers who understand the importance of circular economy and uh, how intertwined it is with technology development and uh, reinforced competitiveness. So. You know the importance well, Saman, of you, you you are covering you're you're covering a lot of questions questions and then join the link that's a uh, you know and synthesize them as um i hope the audience can can process this a big chunk of information and data it takes supercomputer to do that well i would like to invite other you know mark and gurgis is any question that you can specifically answer and to uh from a different angle very likely well, listen, maybe I, I can, uh, uh, there's a question that I think is still there that I can uh, answer about platformization because I, I actually been writing about it lately uh, from a slightly different perspective. So um, to the question that you're asking, by, but I think uh, platformization is not accelerating uh, the circular economy because uh, uh, first of all, the access to uh, the level of technology required to move into platforms are just for a niche. We're really talking about an oligopoly of companies that currently can do that. We do have a problem with the portability of technology into the small medium enterprises. So today, platformization is the largest form of marketing efficiency we have ever seen in human history. Uh, I've been writing in a very critic way against platforms because platforms are creating the larger distortion of the market we have ever had. Uh, so no, they're not accelerating the circular economy. On the contrary, they are creating a much larger gap between small medium enterprises and very few technology companies. So I'm hoping in the next few years, a month actually, that uh, standards and governance will continue to actually um, hold the technology company more to account uh, in terms of the fact that they need to work in the interest of generating value, not in the interest of extracting value. Today, platforms are the most extractive forms of digital rents we've ever seen. And so we should actually be extremely careful. Um, they look green because they are very efficient in the way they generate value, but they represent 
such a small group of people in the world, they are inconsequential to the changes required to move towards a circular economy. So we should actually really try to think more proactively about the role of technology companies. The way they currently operate today is not helping anybody but themselves. Okay. Thank you, Mark. And Yogos, do you have any uh, comments on some of the questions that posted? And, and probably we can go back to the question from uh, Mona Lisa actually um, about the consumer behavior change towards the sustainable uh, sustainability in the circular economy model. Uh, well, thanks, Lisa. I mean, just to echo uh, uh, things that have been said, especially also the last comments from Mark, and I would underline one thing that Mark shared, which is related to the transferability of technology to SMEs, because let's not forget uh, they are the backbone of most of the economies. So the, the fact that uh, they are operating at large scales, and I agree with Mark, and they look green, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are uh, um, uh, servicing a green benefit. Um, so that's something that we need to, to, to bear in mind because again, the whole point is the big picture and the big picture includes a, 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 an abundance of SMEs around the globe with different capacities. Even an, even an SME from um, two European countries, like for example, from Germany to my home country, Cyprus, even within this context, they have different characteristics, let alone if we're talking about other underdeveloped countries. So this is something I wanted to, 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 to underline and I agree with Mark on that. The other point is that related to consumer behavior, I mean, that is totally something which, uh, I mean, I would reverse the question and say, didn't consumer behavior have the prime role to play to where we stand today with the overconsumption and the overproduction? So this is exactly the same paradigm that we have here. In some countries, I don't want to make uh, uh, references to companies, because of the cultural shift, people, for example, they are um, having this um, possibility to take the clothes of babies to, um, you know, central locations that are being, you know, washed, et cetera, et cetera, because babies grow so fast and they're made available to, you know, with quality checks, et cetera, with, to other babies. So they are kind of doing clothes sharing but not in a cheap or whatever way, in a very sensible and conscious way. So there are a lot of examples, uh, mini or mega, uh, that we can uh, cite. And definitely uh, consumer behavior has a huge impact to play on circular economy. So that's definitely there. With a couple of comments on the technological aspects, I agree with Saman, there are a lot of thoughts behind that. Um, uh, cryptocurrencies, distributed ledgers, but also let not forget, I mean, cryptocurrency is a currency. So, and all these business models that we're talking, they will still need to have currencies, whether it's paper currency, whether it's electronic currency. So the discussion is that um, even paper currency is a sort of pollution. So if we take that into account uh, and it can be resolved in a good and, and reliable way, technologically speaking, that is friendly to the environment, yes, why not? So uh, we need to start being open, not dogmatic. I'm, I'm not saying we have to accept everything or decline everything, but we have to op be open to change. And that is, is the key word here. Well, thank you, Georges, on that. And I could, if I, can, if I may, I can add a little bit on top of that because the, I wrote on sustainable luxury. So about moving towards the circular economy model. And so the traditional way of recycling, now we're moving into another model. For example, some of the genes can be rented or trying to promote more brand. They treat using recycled material as fashion as well. It's not necessarily to be discounted as an inferior product. And some of the uh, fast fashion or more prevalent fashion like Zara, which were to be blamed in the past because it was too fast and people, especially women, they, re they changed their wardrobe very fast. But now they're engaging more of the recycled cotton in jeans and not necessarily is cheaper, but it's a similar price. So people, the consumer, they share, they feel the responsibility of carrying the planet and rather than psychologically thinking that recycled, it's not necessarily good. So just to put a little bit on top. 
Um, there is another question just freshly come out. It said, what I'm interested in is also know how governments and organizations can start regulating the counter machinery like platforms, which could be pushed us away from the circular economy. I think this question it's addressed probably Mark could answer. I can start that, Lisa. Okay. Um, so, and you know, Viber, thanks for following up on this. I think we've been talking for too long about the wrong kind of governance. If we break down Google into small Google, we're not going to address the problem because the issue with the technology companies is their economic model. They make money out of engagement. So for them, truth or the absence of truth, they have the same economic value. And I think the challenge is how do we get them to work by generating value that currently they are not, rather than thinking about breaking them down into smaller uh, entity. You know, when you are using a MacBook and suddenly your search engine is defaulted to uh, Google, that's because Google paid billions of dollars to Apple for that to be defaulted. And if you're on Bing, the 90% of searches on Bing is Google. It doesn't really help, right? So I think to the point, Viva, we need to really think the same way we did for the, the tobacco companies back in time, the fast food companies, the oil and gas companies, all of this company used to be company that we found problematic at a point in time. But by increasing standards, we have protected them from eventually just the, the reckless nature of the market. And also we protected ourselves from the right use of technology, the right use of uh, for example, the food companies, the right use of the pharmaceuticals. So I always think standards is where we have to start. This is why going back to the question Lisa asked in the past, uh, policies at the center of this. Only governments can really work together to determine what can actually be the way forward. And one of the things that you know I, I personally find the European project still to be a project that I'm in love with is that the European project is a super parties project. We need a super parties project to deal with challenge of the nature. No country on its own is big enough to deal with these companies. There is a, a quick story about Australia being unhappy with Google for something and Google's challenging Australia by saying, well, then I'll charge you per search. So you have a technology company that can also blackmail a country, but that wouldn't happen in, in contests like the EU. It could not happen in contests like the US. Um, you know, it probably would not happen in the context of China. So large country or super part of this country, I think they have the best interest in trying to help the technology companies to get regulated, not to break them down, but to let them work around certain kinds of standards. In the same way, and I'll finish with this, when we decided to have standards for banking, we protected the ability for us to send money around the world by preserving the same value. So if I was sending $10 from the US to Europe, I was guaranteed that the same amount was basically received. It's standards that allow us to operate. So I, I think technology standards will become more important in the next few years. Um, and I think it's going to happen. It's just a matter of how we're going to get the right political uh, angle and getting policymakers to understand technology a little bit more, technology people to understand policymakers a little bit more, and, and see how we find convergence. But that's why we're here, right? Because we, we are the convergent. Great. Well, um, the collaboration and especially the, the different integration of the cooperation collaboration, of course, European Union is one of the almost like a fairy tale happened in human history of the economic babeling, right? And um, from emergence to convergence, it sounds like just two words, switch and shift. But actually, the process is it's zigzagged. And sometimes even we have to backwards a little bit. So um, it's not a it's not a very smooth road. Um, I'm sorry, guys, I think I'm about to coming to wrapping up now. So and but before we go, since this is, looks like a party, so we know each other for a long time, I'm just using this opportunity to catch up with everyone. So Georgis, tell me about about your current involvement with this with, you know, certain economy and what are the projects active at the moment? Um, Fast, you know, in a one-minute way, okay? <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm going to use 30 seconds. We're doing a lot of work with that. We are transforming the work we're doing, the scientific research into research of wider, uh, sort of into knowledge of, for wider audience. We have taken the initiative to start this Circular Economy Alliance that we will be supporting all these new uh, challenges. 
But I want to use 30 seconds to echo something that Mark said, and I want to underline that um, because change does not happen by itself. And the colleague before asked this question about how is this going to happen? There's this famous model, nothing about us without us. And the example that we are here together today, after all these years of friendship and connection, and we are taking steps and we are voicing our concerns uh, with research, with the connection that we are having, is exactly what is needed. Because also the policymakers are not gurus on everything. They need people like us. They need this convergence to be able to take the necessary steps forward. So if people are not participating in this, um, then that's where we're losing the game. The corporates, they will, do, they will continue doing what they're doing. The policymakers, they will be ignorant. And, and that, that's gonna be the, the game that we, are not, we, we, are, we cannot afford having. That's why I'm so happy and proud for everybody in this call that we have taken these steps forward and we are using our time to take this forward in the most profound way and supporting all these activities. So that's how we're taking forward, Lisa. Um, sorry for abusing the time. Well, thank you, Georges, for wrapping this up. And um, go back to go back to Mark. And could you share with us, you know, what what, what kind of projects you've been up to lately? So I'll share the two most exciting updates. The first one is um, we're writing a book with Taryn C. That is another friend of all of you, and uh, Olaf Growth, who is a, a friend of some of you. Um, that will be published by MIT. Um, we're writing about the great remobilization. Uh, so we're writing about the world in the post-pandemic and how we would like to rewrite the rules. So it's probably the most important book project that I ever work on with people that I trust so much. And I'm hoping that, you know, the value of the work we're doing uh, by interviewing people and by trying to go as deep as we can with the big questions uh, will generate value for years to come. And the second project that I'm doing with some of our uh, friend, uh, Amit Kapoor, is part of the MOC network as well. We're writing with Cambridge University Press another book uh, on the premise of the fourth industrial revolution for the emerging economies, because we really want to make sure that the emerging economies, country with millions and millions of people, are going to be able to be part of the conversation. And that's another interesting project. As you know, Amit is very close to the uh, Indian government. We're currently doing a project together for another government. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, these two projects that are converging. And, and uh, you know, as soon as the, we'll start having uh, more, um, I would say, sub, uh, substantial updates, we release. But today on LinkedIn, prior to I share an article that we published today, that is already the very beginning of the kind of thinking that we're currently having on the book project. So that's what is keeping me busy right now, Lisa. Well, thank you for sharing this with us. And then um, I've always been very fascinated by how, how you're shaping up the project by working with people in the past that you had experience and then to make this relationship and collaboration and flourish into the next step. And okay, I go to Saman then. So where where is your focus right now? And can you share us with you know the work that you are doing? Sure, thank you, Lisa. So I keep it short for my personal side. Uh, well, on my personal side, uh, working on a book uh, on the same topic: technology, circular economy, and competitiveness, and uh, a couple of uh, projects in the blockchain space and distributed ledger technologies uh, for the same purpose of sustainability, circular economy. But I uh, keep the focus more on what we are doing at the school and uh, some interesting uh, upcoming projects that we have is the tech center that we have. Basically, it's not uh, necessarily a research center. It's uh, rather a center to bring uh, all the great work that our participants are doing in our lead tech global executive MBA program and our executive DBA program in terms of research around uh, technology, circular economy and competitiveness as a way to link the work and sort of warm them up to be more involved with circular economy research center and center for policy and competitiveness, those who are really uh, leveraging technology for their research. So uh, these are some interesting projects that we are working at the school for our uh, new programs. And uh, I'll be happy to share more, but I know that uh, you'll kill me after. <laughs> but since you already mentioned about the, um, the tax center, actually, it's, it's a channel, that's a way of channel to help 
um, our students, participants, their work to get more exposed, not only in their doing their project, but also actually scholarly work or practitioner work it needs to be heard and to, to be read by people. Therefore, to go back to the to go back to the pool of the real world to guide guide the managerial practice. I'm ha very happy to see that. And um, and our school, it got upon um, it got upon business school is doing around this topic. And so, is there any way that participants you want to talk about the EMBA program or the doctoral program? Um, how would they if, if people are interested? How could they be? You know, how could they be supported and with all these research centers besides they, their quality work will be exposed in the future tax center? Are there any support uh, from the school to guide them? Definitely. So, yeah, we have different uh, programs, uh, certificate courses with, uh, with Mark and with Yorgos as well uh, around the topics. But most importantly, we launched our new EMBA program last year with EADA Business School, our partner. Uh, the EMBA program is uh, anchored around technology, innovation, and leadership. And uh, the support that they get from the research centers is not only uh, throughout the year. Uh, Mark is a professor, uh, Yorgos is a professor in the program. But also uh, what we do is that we bring uh, concrete support from the industry. Uh, for this year, we had several hackathons uh, based on tech for impact, technology for secure economy. It's coming up next month. We had one uh, dedicated to fintech and we had one dedicated for uh, uh, AI and bias and uh, women empowerment. So uh, we have uh, several types of different projects that are going on in our EMBA program. And our EDBA program is uh, comes naturally with that. We have... Uh, more than 10 doctoral candidates actively working with Yorgos under CERC uh, with the upcoming cohort. And uh, with Mark also, those who are interested, like yourself and me, so those who are interested uh, in working uh, with CPC, Mark provides a great support there. So EDBA candidates and participants also are fully supported by this. So we are proud uh, for uh, you know taking an interest in, in people and participants in our uh, alumni network and linking them for impact solutions. Well, thank you for sharing the information. And just to share with everyone is that the, one of the reasons I, I chose Ecole de Pont and Business School is that it's a very uh, it's a very high entrepreneurial and business school rather than rather than providing the position for people to dive into the project and work in the cubicles and then to work on someone else project. And actually, I can get a chance to choose what what really means to me, what's valuable from my sense and what is the domain that I want to work with. So at the same time, in the school, we have different um, experts and people uh, much more established in a scholarly sense where you know that you can reach out to if you experiencing challenges in your own research and to be guided with the right method methodology. And um, I have to wrap up today and thank you very much for everyone joining us. And thank you, Gyorga, Saman and Mark and to participate. And thank you for, for the school to provide me this position as a moderator so I can enjoy the big party and celebrate and catching up with everyone. So the topic from emergence to convergence, technology for competitiveness and circular, circular economy. And these three key words, technology, a competitiveness and circular economy exactly are the center that our school is, is it's, um, it's our identity. And we're realizing I, our identity, not only from the project, but also establishing the research center to make a very straightforward, visible landmark in the school. So um, I know this is not the only webinar, and very likely in the future, we're coming up with a follow-up webinar and with, with much more focused area and narrow area for people to, to give another in-depth look on different subtopic. So thank you very much again for everyone. And thank you for the technical support at the backstage to provide us to organize those questions. Thank you for the time for the early evening from five to six and stay with us. And please stay healthy, stay active and join in the systematic thinking and join us in the collaboration. See you next time.